So far, we looked at plane surface refraction, but now we'll talk about curved surface refraction. And this is where stuff gets real. This will also help us understand properties of lenses later on because they're also curved surfaces. So let's imagine we have some kind of medium over here, which has a refractive index, let's say N2. And its boundary, we'll assume it's a curved surface. It's a spherically curved surface. So it's a part of a sphere, which has a center of curvature over here. And that midpoint of that curvature is over here, which you call is the pole, this is the principal axis. Let's also assume that the outside medium has a, a different refractive index. Let's call that refractive index as N1. And the question we're gonna tackle over here is, if we keep an object somewhere over here, let's say, where will its image be after refraction? That's what we're gonna try and find out. So let's say here's the object. To figure out the image, we have to draw, no surprise, ray diagrams. So let's draw a bunch of rays coming from this object towards this surface. One ray of light will incinerate along the principal axis, and this ray will go undeviated because this is perpendicular to the surface, so the angle of incidence is zero, so there'll be no refraction. And how do we know this is normal? Well, any ray which passes through the center of curvature is going to be normal to the surface. Notice this ray passes through the center of curvature, so it's normal, it goes undeviated. Now to see where the image will be, we have to draw at least another one more ray. Let's draw an oblique ray. Now this ray will bend over here, it will refract, and to figure out exactly how it refracts, you have to draw a normal to at this point. And again, normal has to pass through the center of curvature. And let's assume that this is a denser medium compared to this one. And so this ray of light will now bend towards the normal. And so this ray of light would bend towards the normal. And now really, how much it bends really depends upon how dense this is compared to this. Let's assume it's dense enough that the two rays, these two rays, will eventually meet at some point over here, creating a real image. So let's, that's an assumption, all right? So we are assuming that N2 is larger than N1, it's large enough for the, the, this ray to bend enough to meet at this point, and that's where we are getting a real image. Now the big question is, if we know what the object distance is, can we figure out what the image distance will be? What does it depend on? That's what we need to figure out. All right, so let's do this, but where do we even begin? How do I bring my object distance and image distance into the picture? That's the question. Well, there's only one thing we know when it comes to refraction, Snell's law. So that's probably, will, that's where we start, all right? So Snell's law connects the angle of incidence to the angle of refraction. And this is the incident ray. We'll apply Snell's law to this point. So let's call it point as M, let's say. And this is the incident ray, this is the normal, so this would be the angle of incidence. Let's call it as I. This is the refracted ray and this is the normal, so this is the angle of refraction over here. Let's call it as R. And now Snell's law tells us that N1 sine I, N1 sine I, that's going to be N2, N2 sine R, sine R. And we're gonna make one, one approximation. The approximation is we're gonna choose, we're gonna assume that this point M is very close to point P. In other words, we're gonna assume that MP is a very tiny value compared to the radius of curvature. So it's much smaller than the radius of curvature, which is PC, okay? The reason we're doing this is because, well, when M comes very close over here, this incident ray will be actually somewhere along this line, and as a result, this angle of incidence, I, will be a very tiny value, which means this angle R is also going to be very tiny. And that means we can use small angle approximations over here. That's the whole reason we are doing that, so that the math becomes easier. All right, so small angle approximation is we can assume sine theta is just theta. So sine i, will assume it to be just i. And this will be n2 times sine r can be assumed to be just r. So that's that comes from this approximation. All right, so what do we do next? Remember, we need to connect the object distance and the image distance. Somehow, we need to bring this into the picture. What's the connection? So, obviously, the next question would be, what's the connection between I, R, and these distances? How do we bring them into the picture? Well, we can't see the connection directly, but if we define new angles, so if we define an angle over here, let's call it as A, you'll see why we're defining that. 
We'll define another angle called B here, and let's define another angle over here called a C. If we define these three angles, we can somehow bring the object distance and image distance into the picture here. Let's see how. First of all, we can connect angle I and R with A, B, and C. We can do that using the properties of a triangle. So that's how we can introduce A, B, and C over here somehow. And once we have brought these angles, well, we can define now these angles in terms of these lengths. That's possible by looking at these triangles. All right, so that's the rough, that's the rough flow that we're gonna go for. All right, so the first step is to somehow bring A, B, C into the picture. Can you see a connection between the angle I, A, and B? I want you to pause the video and think about that connection. I'll give you a clue, look at this triangle, giant triangle over here, all right? Well, angle I is the exterior angle, and A and B are the interior angles, so you may have already learned that the sum of the, sum of the interior angles must be equal to the exterior angle. So I equals A plus B. So instead of I, we can just write this as A plus B. And that will be equal to N2, N2 into R. Again, I want you to pause the video and see if you can find a connection this time between R and B and C. Again, the trick is the same. Look at this big triangle now. All right, this time R and C are the interior angles. So if we add R plus C, we must get B. And so R is just B minus C. So we can put that over here. R is B minus C. And now since MP is a very tiny patch on this entire sphere, we can assume it to be flat. Just like when you take a tiny patch on Earth, we assume it to be flat. And now we can use this right angle triangle with a very tiny angle and figure out what A is. So let's write that down. So this equation is now going to be N1 times, what is angle A? Well, let's look at this triangle. We can use small angle approximation. A is the same as tan A, right? And what is tan A equal to? Well, that's opposite side, MP, divided by the object distance, OP, OP. Plus, what is B equal to? Well, can you look at this figure and similarly figure out which triangle we should use and again, use the same approximation? I want you to pause the video and see if you can fill in these now. Figure out what B is and what angle C is. All right, let's see. To figure out angle B, let's look at this triangle and do the same thing, small angle approximation. So B is the same as tan B, and tan B is going to be the opposite side, MP, divided by the adjacent side. The adjacent side PC is just the radius of curvature, PC. That equals N2 times, again B is the same as MP, divided by PC, minus C. Well, what is angle C? Well, look at this big triangle now. Again, small angle approximation. C is the same as tan C. That's going to be the opposite side divided by the adjacent side, which is the image distance. So that's going to be PI. And if you look at this equation carefully, we have found what we wanted because we have the relationship between the object and the image distances. All we have to do is make this expression a little bit more pretty. All right, so MP is common, so we can take it out from here, we can take it out from here, and we can divide, so the MP cancels out. Second of all, this need not be a general formula because we are deriving it for this specific case. We have assumed over here that the ray of light is going to bend enough to come and meet over here, but in general, it need not. For example, if N2 value was a little lower, then maybe this ray of light would have bent only so much. Now see, these two rays, appear to be coming from somewhere over there. And so we would have gotten a different formula. Maybe if this was curved the other way around, again, you would have gotten a different situation. So there are so many cases available over here. So we might start panicking now, but we don't have to because we have a superpower with us, sign conventions. We've seen in mirrors how by using sign conventions, we can make a general formula. Guess what? We'll do the same thing over here. If we use sign conventions and substitute, then we'll end up getting the general formula. Again, we'll not, derive, we'll not prove that, but it turns out to be true. And the sign convention is the same. We're gonna treat pole as our origin, and incident direction is going to be positive, so everything on the right side of the pole is going to be positive positions, everything to the left side of the pole are going to be negative positions. And now we can substitute 
So let's make a little bit more room over here and see what we get. So if we substitute, we get n1 into 1 over object distance op, but that's a negative. So we'll call it minus u plus 1 over pc. pc is the radius of curvature, and that's positive because the c is on the positive side. So that's going to be r plus r. That's going to be n2 times 1 over pc, which is r, minus 1 over pi. Again, pi is positive because i is on the positive side. So that's going to be v. Image distance is v. And now all we have to do is simplify this. So pretty much physics is almost done. Not almost, physics is done. We just have to simplify this now. So let's make some more room now and let's simplify this. So let's do this over here. We get minus n1 over u plus n1 over r, which is multiplying, multiplying, equals n2 over r minus n2 over v. And the last step, we're just going to put u and v on one side and the r terms on the other side. So that will give us, we'll add n2 by v on both sides. So we'll get, we'll write that down over here, n2 over v minus n1 over u minus n1 over u, that will be equal to n2 minus n1. I'm going to subtract n1 by r on both sides. So that's going to be n n2 minus n1 divided by r. Just check that. All I've done is rearrange this, and this will be our equation for curved surfaces. So this is a general formula that will work for any case for curved surface refraction. So pretty big deal. We might have to remember this for numericals and stuff. So the last thing I wanna do is tell you how I love to remember this formula. So you see, if you look at this refractive index N2, that's really the refractive index of the medium that contains the refracted ray. This is the refracted ray. And it's divided by the image distance. That's nice for me because after refraction comes the image distance. So I remember it as the refracted medium. This is the refracted medium divided by the image distance minus N1, well that's the refractive index that contains the incident ray. So I like to think of this as the incident medium. And incident, where, where does incident ray come from? That comes from the object. So incident medium divided by the object distance. That's how I remember this and I don't get confused. So I always remember refracted medium by image distance minus incident medium divided by the object distance, that equals this minus this. See, it's n2 minus n1. We have to be very careful with the order, n2 minus n1 divided by the radius of curvature.